Welcome to the Key to Successful Network Marketing with Dr. Jim Will. Dr. Jim Will received his PhD with honors in educational psychology from the University of Oklahoma. His postgraduate work included individual counseling and working throughout all levels of local, national, and international corporations. Early work by Dr. Will, studying high performers, led him to develop his unique brand of self-image psychology, which has been instrumental in helping thousands of people change the way they look at themselves and improving their self-image and self-esteem. A noted international speaker, Dr. Will has shared his philosophy with people around the world. Dr. Will has worked with hundreds of businesses of every size, representing a wide variety of industries. He significantly improved customer services in many different types of businesses, from banks to five and six star hotels and cruise lines. And now in this presentation, Dr. Will will set out a specific mindset that will lead you to success in your network marketing business. And now let's listen to Dr. Jim Will in front of a live audience. Let's give Jim another round of applause, will you? Good morning. Well, welcome, and I think you're truly at the right place at the right time. Um, Chris and some of the other folks are handing out a little brochure that you're going to get, and it doesn't matter which one you receive. What I'd like for you to do when you get one of them is to open it up, and right down here there's a sentence. And I'd like for you to look at the sentence and read it. And your sentence should say something like self-image psychology. Did everybody find that? Yeah. When you find that sentence, I want you to read it two or three times. And then I want you to count how many times you see. Let's start with the letter A. Count how many times you see the letter A. Okay, how many A's do you see in your sentence? Seven? Eight? Who got the one with six? Okay, mainly over on this side and a few in the back. How many of you got the one with five? Okay, I heard five, six, seven, and eight. Any more than eight, less than, than five. All right, now I want you to take a look at and count how many times you see the letter F. Three, four, five, six. Who got the one with two? Two right up here and a few back there. Any more than six, less than two? Okay. Who's absolutely sure of their answer? And what is the correct answer? Six F's and how many A's? Eight A's and six F's. Does everybody agree with this lady? Uh-oh. No. What's the correct answer? Seven A's and three F's. Seven A's and three F's. Does everybody agree with this gentleman? Okay. This gentleman back here. 10 F's, all right, and how many A's? Well, we could go on and on. We've got several hundred people here in the audience, and yet what we found is that everybody seems to have a different answer, a different opinion. And I'll save you all a little bit of time. They're all the same. Everybody here is looking at the same sentence, and yet what's happening? We've all got a different opinion, a different attitude. What is the correct answer? Well, I hear the correct answer. Eight A's and there's six F's. Also, if you can't find them, you might ask your neighbor or you might ask a five or a six-year-old child. And guess how many A's and F's they will find? That's correct. And when they ask you how many you found, you just take that brochure away from them and you say, that doesn't matter. Go do your schoolwork so that you'll become smart like the rest of us, right? Smart, intelligent people miss something as simple as A's and F's right in front of their eyes. And if those A's and F's had been a snake, what would they have done? They'd bit us. So the A's and F's are right there in front of us, but why did we miss them? It's called a scotoma. S-C-O-T-O-M-A. A scotoma, it's a Greek word meaning a lack of vision. And it's actually a medical term. An optometrist used this. And, and what it is, is it's a blind spot. It's a blindness. And you can't see something that's right in front of you. I came up with this sentence many years ago. And I've shown this around the world, literally, to hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people. And most people will miss some of the A's and some of the F's. Most of them. So y'all are okay. You're normal. All right? But why would a five or a six-year-old child see something that you and I don't see? 
because they haven't been conditioned yet. They haven't been conditioned to believe in certain things that they can or they can't do. And that's what I want to do this morning is to try to open up our eyes and to ask ourselves if we miss something as simple as A's and F's right there in front of us, could we be missing other opportunities to recruit new people into our organization? Now you've got an outstanding company, a great marketing plan, a great management team, the compensation is outstanding, the product is outstanding, everything is, is really fantastic about this, and what's going to keep you and I from accomplishing true success? Is it going to be you or your neighbor or your relatives? Is it going to be your right arm or your left arm? No, I think it's going to be ourself. Now, what do I mean by that? I've been studying high performance people for the last 25 years. And I went around and I would ask athletes, professional people, parents, whoever was really enjoying and succeeding in life, how they were so successful. And you know what most of the people would say to me? They said, well, well, I worked hard, concentrate, set goals, and they give me a lot of things that are very valuable and important, but very few, if any of them, ever explained about their self-talk. Now, on the front of that brochure, you see the power of self-talk. And that's been my niche for all these years, is helping people to understand how our self-talk can affect us. Have a positive mental attitude, and you're going to be very successful in this company. I wish it were that easy. Have we tried that? Sure. What happens? We, we try to be thinking positive, but yet what does our self-talk say? And that's what I want to get into today is why, how in the world can we manage to control that self-talk? Let's back up for a second. The scotomas, the A's and the F's, the real reason that we did not see the A's and the F's and we missed some of them was that we had an attitude about A's and F's. Now, did any of you realize that you had an attitude when you came in here this morning about an A and an F? Of course not. But what other attitudes and beliefs and opinions might you have that you've been carrying around with you for years and years and years that are affecting you both positively and negatively? Now, what do you mean, Jim? You've got an attitude about A's and F's. Well, we were taught to read phonetically back in a place called Shul, S-C-H-O-O-L. They started messing with our minds back then. And what do I mean by that? Well, see, phonetically, and look at the word phonics. It's misspelled, isn't it? Phonics. It should be F-O, but it's a P-H. And what's the word of? It's not O-F, is it? What does it sound? It's, it's spelled O-F, but what does it sound like? A V, exactly, a U-V or an O-V. And this is how powerful our minds are. We lock on to certain beliefs and certain attitudes. And in this situation, we lock on to the belief that of is a V. And then the other word perhaps that we miss the A's in is unaware. Are we aware of everything? Oh yes, we're very aware of our circumstance, our environment. But what happens is that we lock on to certain beliefs and attitudes. And this is why a five or a six year old child typically will find the A's and the F's when you show them this sentence because they're just starting to learn to read and they're just starting to look at the alphabet and they see all the letters as they really are. But you and I have been picking up beliefs and attitudes and in this situation, picking up the belief and the attitude that of sounds like a V and therefore we must have a blind spot, a scotoma to the F that's right there in front of us. Again, what other beliefs and attitudes might be affecting us? I was doing a seminar for a group about this size over in Lafayette. And I asked them, I said, how many of you all believe in voodoo? And half the room raised their hand. I said, why does voodoo work? And they looked at me, and what did they finally say? Because we believe in it? Yes. Now I want you to start to think about what beliefs and attitudes do you have? What voodoos might we have that are hurting us, that are interfering with us? Those that are hurting us, how can we get rid of those and let go of those? And those attitudes, beliefs, and opinions that are helping us, how can we reinforce them and keep them coming on a constant and a consistent basis? I mentioned about self-talk. Self-talk is a concept that uh, is very dear to me. You and I talk to ourselves at an incredible rate of speed. I've been talking right now, but you all have been talking to yourself. We talk to ourselves somewhere around maybe three, four, five thousand words a minute. Now we can only talk out loud maybe three or four or five hundred words a minute. 
talking on the telephone, making a presentation, introducing ourselves, telling somebody about our great opportunity. And yet with our own self-talk, with our own thinking, our own internal dialogue, we're talking about 10, 15, maybe 20 times faster. Now, what's interesting and I think scary at the same time is that you and I, it's estimated, are talking somewhere between 60, 70, maybe as high as 80 or 90% negative. Now, you know some people whose self-talk is completely off the charts. You go in the morning, you say good morning to them, they go, hey, what's so good about it? And they're just rotten, right? And yet what happens is that most of us, and I mean you and I, hardworking people, and we think that we're pretty positive, but let me ask you this. Would you let me talk to you the way that you talk to you sometimes? You know, I need a ride back over to my place. And you say, okay, Jim, fine, I'll take you over there. And all of a sudden, as soon as we start, I start in on you. Nip, 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 nip. And remember how you messed up that deal the other day and you blew that and all of a sudden, what happens? You'd stop your car, wouldn't you? After a few minutes, you'd stop and you'd say, Jim, look, I don't mind taking you to your place, but would you please get off my back? And I go, okay, fine. And then all of a sudden we start up again and then all of a sudden, if I started in on you again, and don't we do that to ourselves a lot of times? So what we want to do is, first of all, be aware that we do talk to ourselves. Now, my background is in psychology. We used to kid each other. We said, it's okay to talk to yourself, but if you start to answer, then we were supposed to check in our keys at that moment. And yet, the good news and the thing that I want to share with you today is that it's not only okay to talk to yourself, but I don't think you can stop talking to yourself. You call me if you can ever figure out how to stop talking to yourself. And you let me know because I don't think we can. I think we're talking to ourselves constantly. As soon as we get up in the mornings, we're talking to ourselves when we're taking a shower, pouring a cup of coffee. As soon as we start to pick up that 800 pound telephone to make a call to invite somebody to a meeting or to invite somebody over to hear what we've got to say. And we're talking to ourselves all the time. Just in case any of you are sitting there thinking, what is he talking about talking to yourself? I don't talk to myself, never have talked to myself. I hear that crazy people talking to themselves and I'm certainly not crazy. That's what I'm talking about right there. Huh? Gotcha, right? So we all do it. We all talk to ourselves. And again, what I want to do is to share with you some tools and techniques. First, knowing that it's okay to talk to yourself, you can't stop it. And then by managing controlling it, that's when we start to see how it affects all aspects of our life. 85% of your success in this organization, at home, in life, is based on how well you communicate. 85%. Now that's not Jim Will's statistic. That is a Mellon Foundation study that came out with that many years ago and they said 85% of our success is based on how well we communicate. 15% of our success is based on our product, on our knowledge, our education, our skills, our information, our service. Now we've got a great product. We've got all these fantastic things that we're involved with, but what's gonna really help us to be successful in this business and in life? It's our communication skills. Now, I believe that that to be true. And let's look at the way we communicate. The words that we speak, the words that I'm saying right now, the words that you say to people that are dear to you, they are actually the smallest portion of the communication process. Somewhere between five to 10% of the communication that goes on between people is made up of the words that we say. What about the tone of the voice? Dear, the tone of the voice, honey, what's wrong with you tonight? I said I love you. We don't hear the words a lot of times, do we? What happens? We hear the tone of the voice. We watch the body language. The tone of the voice in the communication process is anywhere from 30 or 40% of the message all the way up to as high as 80 or 90% when you're on the telephone. So we've got the words, five, 10% of the communication process is made up of the words, it's important. Granted, you've got to say the right words at the right sequence at the right time but the way you say them is as important, if not more important. Now you can try this. If any of you have got a puppy dog at home, you can say the words, 
And it's the tone of the voice that the, that the dog picks up on. And all of a sudden we can say, come here puppy dog, and say nice loving words with a nice tone of voice, and that puppy dog will come jumping in our lap. But we can say mean, hateful words with a nice tone of voice, and guess what? That dog doesn't understand the words. It'll still come over. Loving words in a mean tone of voice, and that dog will scoot out the door. So animals pick up on that. What about the body language? What about the nonverbal communication? What about the look or the eyebrows or the way we use our, our, our the tilt our heads? The body language is anywhere from 50% of the communication process all the way up to 100%. I was hired in, in Nagasaki, Japan to work on a Crystal Harmony, which is a six-star cruise ship. It's a very, very high-end luxury cruise liner. My job was to help 44 different countries, different nationalities, to help all those people that were from the deckhand to the captain to learn to communicate effectively. And what I told them was that the communication, the body language, was the one language that everybody understands. Have you ever met somebody, shook their hand, and then go, what was her name? Have you all done that? Am I the only one? <laughs> I think we've all done that. Why is that? Well, I think that you and I are analyzing each other constantly. I was working with a company that I've been a, been a friend now for 20 years with, they're a printing company. We had a small group of people sitting around a table. We were talking to their managers. And there's one lady, she looked at me. She said, so, Dr. Will, she said, are you, uh, are you sitting there analyzing us? And I thought for a moment, and I said, well, yes, I am. But I looked at her, and I said, but aren't you all analyzing me? And she nodded. She said, we sure are. We sure are. And I think that's what's happening. The people that you go and approach and that you're trying to tell them about this great opportunity, they're analyzing you, you're analyzing them. And what happens is that we are with our own self-talk when we're meeting somebody for the first time, maybe the second, maybe the third time. How long does it take for a first impression to, to, to go into effect? Well, you say two or three minutes, I think two or three seconds, instantly. And I think what's happening is that you and I are analyzing each other as we're shaking that person's hand, and with our own self-talk, we're saying, I know somebody like that, and they're doing that to you as well. If my self-talk is, these people aren't going to buy what I have to say, then guess what? My tone of voice and my body language and even the words that come out of my mouth are going to sound like. We meet somebody for the first time, all of a sudden we don't remember their name. I think that's exactly what happens. We start to analyze them. So how do we start to be aware of that communication process that's so vital to our success, both personally and professionally? It goes back up to mission control. When working with NASA, when uh, unfortunately the Challenger disaster took place, they called me in to work with their, all their people. It, it obviously was a terrible tragedy. And I told them, mission control is our self-talk. So we go back up to mission control and we start to become aware of what we're saying. Most people with that self-talk being 60, 70, 80, 90% negative, it's like going to a grocery store with a list of things that you don't want to get. Now how crazy is that? If you write down all the things that you don't want to get at the grocery store, it would be a long list, wouldn't it? It would be a long list. And that's what's happening to you and I when we're thinking about things that we don't want in our life. If we think about the things that we don't want, well, I don't want to be assertive, I don't want to be pushy, I don't want to come across too strong, I don't want all these things, then guess what? So what I want you to do is to start thinking about what it is that you do want. And if you start to manage, control your self-talk in terms of what it is that you do want, there's a concept, there's a mechanism that we're blessed to have in the central cortex of our brain called the reticular activating system. It's uh, the RAS for short. And how does it work? My theory is that it, it's triggered through our self-talk. Isn't it amazing how some people see opportunity everywhere? Some people will find people to recruit and to sponsor everywhere. And then other people that you may know, they say, well, there's nobody out there that's interested. And what happens? They build a scotoma, a blind spot to opportunity that's right there in front of them. And all of a sudden, the person, you know, somebody that says, I don't know where I'm going to find my next person, but I know they're out there, then that's triggering that radar system. How many Starbucks did you all see from the time you left? Oh, well, let's say all week long. How many Starbucks, Jim? I don't know. Who cares, right? 
I had more important things on my mind. My self-talk was someplace else than to count Starbucks. Oh, they didn't tell you I was going to give you $1,000 for every Starbucks that you saw all this week? Ten of them. Isn't that amazing? Flashback, perfect memory. Well, they're out there, but unless they're of value to us, we're going to be oblivious to them. As soon as you got a new car, what did you start to see out there everywhere? Same car. Same car. Isn't that amazing? And, and you know, there's some of you that even start to honk and wave <laughs> to those people. We're now in the same club, aren't we? I bought a new car a few years ago, and I told the salesman, I said, gee, that sure is a unique color. And that salesman, he goes, oh, hmm, what did it? Got through his radar immediately. Got through his consciousness. He said, oh, yes, it's the only one like it in town. <laughs> well, I bought it. And guess what? I parked next to one that very day. As soon as I got it, I went over to Beaumont, and I parked right next to the same, uh, hmm, gee whiz. And then I started seeing that color everywhere. But I had a scotoma, a blind spot, until it became a value. So what's of value to you? That's what's going to trigger that reticular activating system. If 60, 70, 80 percent of our thoughts are negative, if 60, 70, 80 percent of our thoughts are thinking about what we don't want, then unfortunately that becomes the thing that is of value to us, whether we like it or not. Scotomas, blind spots. God, they can cost you business. They can cost you happiness. They can cost you prosperity. They can cost you a lot of things. The scary part about scotomas is that they are contagious. They're very contagious. The beliefs and the attitudes and the opinions that you hold very dearly to you, that you've been consciously or subconsciously handing out to people in your organization, in your downline, people in your family that are, that are very loved and important to you, those beliefs and attitudes, you've got to start to check those. I was doing a seminar aboard a cruise ship and Carlton Fisk, he's now a Hall of Famer, came up to me after a short presentation. He said, you know, he said, uh, my little league coach told me that if I got into a batting slump, I would be around maybe 14, 15, 16 at bats before I could get out of that slump. And he said, what you just taught me, I don't have to buy that anymore. He said, is that right? And I said, that's exactly right. Now here's a Hall of Famer, World Series, got everything in the world professionally. And yet, what was the voodoo? What was the belief? What was the attitude that he had been carrying around since an expert? And who was that expert? A little league coach. But what happened was that with Carlton's self-talk, he bought the information from an expert and started to reinforce it. And every time he started to get into a slump, what do you think his self-talk was? Yeah, here comes another slump. I know what's going to happen, 14 to 16 at bats. What slumps might you have? What, what beliefs, what attitudes, what beliefs and attitudes have been laid on you by good intentioned people, but check it and analyze it and make sure that you're sending what you say through a filter system, making sure that you're not laying some beliefs and attitudes that could be harmful and causing your people and your organization a scotoma. How many of you all believe in customer satisfaction? Do you think it's important in our business? It's very important. We've got all kinds of customers, don't we? Well, with all due respect, I'd like for you to forget about customer satisfaction. What? What are you talking about? What's the difference between customer satisfaction and customer loyalty? There's a huge difference. As a matter of fact, the experts say that somewhere around 67% of your customers that are satisfied might try another organization, another company. They might try another product or service. Six, that's two-thirds. Can you afford to lose two-thirds of your hard-worked efforts and time recruiting, bringing in, finding new business? What's the difference between customer satisfaction versus customer loyalty? The loyal customers, guess what? They go sing our praises, don't they? They go out and they tell other people about us. They're happy to refer new business to us. Are you owned by your customer? What do I mean by that? I was doing a seminar for a car dealership and a young lady came up to me and she said, you know, the other salesmen, she had only been there about a month or two, the other salesmen were teasing her about being owned by the customer. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And she looked at me and she said, well, 
I sold a car to this lady and she called me up. She said, now how do these bells and whistles work? And she went over it on the telephone, but it wasn't sinking in. She said, ma'am, I'll be right out there. This lady not only went out there once, twice, she went out to the lady's house that she sold the car to three different times. And all the other salesmen are sitting back on their hind haunches. And they're saying, you're owned by your customer. And I think that they kind of implied something else in that, in that comment. Well, guess what that lady did who bought the car? How many referrals did she give her? Within one month, she referred three new car sales to that lady. Now, how in the world do we get loyal customers and not just satisfied customers? I think so much of it is timing. You've got to become empathetic. Yes, you've got hold of a gold mine here. But at the same time, timing is, is so very, very important. And you're going to have to pick up on the body language. You're going to have to pick up on the words. You're going to have to pick up on, on the tone of the voice. You're going to have to pick up on those messages that those people are sending to you. Because if you've got a scotoma to those things, then you're going to be frustrated. And you're going to say, I don't know what it is. But, you know, I work hard. I try hard. But what happens? We've got this blind spot, we've got this scotoma that could be costing us opportunity. It could be costing us ways of building our downline. It could be ways of, of losing money right there. So in order to create a loyal customer, I think that there's, if you can picture this for a moment, there's moments of truth. There's literally thousands and thousands of moments of truth that go on inside of our worlds every day. And they can be a negative moment of truth, they can be a indifferent moment of truth. They can be a positive moment of truth or they can be an ultra golden moment of truth. A negative moment of truth is going to cost you business. It's going to cost you your reputation if you don't turn it around. Now you can have a negative moment of truth and if you turn it around in time, it can actually turn into a positive moment of truth or an ultra golden moment of truth. An indifferent moment of truth if you have any people in your organization, in your downline, that are indifferent to this business, love them and tell them you'll get back with them when, they're, when their attitude has changed. Because an indifferent, oh well, it's just, uh, you know, it's just another business, just another opportunity, oh well, I don't care. You know, they're, they're, their whole lives are just like pessimists. Those people are dangerous to you. They're, they're cancerous. And either they need to change and come your way or else I don't think you and I can afford those type of people. The ultra golden moments of truth, I would say that the lady at the car dealership who, owned, who was owned by the customer, those were ultra golden moments of truth. The more positive moments of truth and the more ultra golden moments of truth that you can give to your customers and to your downline. Now, aren't your downline your customers too? Absolutely. Do you want satisfied downline or do you want loyal downline? Is there a difference? Absolutely. Our real job is learning how to communicate effectively with your people, with your families, with your downline, but also to teach them that same thing. Wouldn't it be great if you could clone you? And in network marketing, that's what it's all about. We're really in an opportunity to clone ourselves. A young man who has worked very hard in his company, in his organization, has gotten up where he reports straight to the owner, and this is a big publicly traded company. And all of a sudden, he's barely 40 years old, still very young. All of a sudden, he is getting the feeling that they're getting ready to move him out. They've brought in another young fella, and they said, he said, what's this guy here for? He said, oh, he's here to help you. And he said, like heck he is. <laughs> and you know what this gentleman's attitude was? There's no way I'm going to tell this young guy a thing because he could take over my job. And the beauty of network marketing is it's the reverse of that. Don't we want to share everything we possibly know to help our downline because we know it's going to come back to help us? You can give them the brochures, you can give them the, the, the overheads, you can give them the PowerPoints, you can give them all the information, but until they start to understand how their self-talk is either going to help them or hurt them. If they've got the negative self-talk, oh, that's fine, you know, you can do it. I, I know that uh, you've already built a great organization, but me? And you listen to their self-talk, and you share this information with them. Because the self-talk is the missing link, in my opinion, to having a happy and successful 
organization, a happy and successful family life. It has everything to do with everything. And you'll see how it even affects our health. So as we become aware of our own self-talk, listen to what you're saying to yourself, realizing that whatever it is that we're saying to ourselves is going to be triggering that radar, that reticular activating system. It's also going to be triggering our body language. I work with a company, a hotel, very nice organization, and they tell all their employees that if a customer or a guest asks them, where is the restroom, or whatever questions that they might have, that they will not only tell them where it is, but a lot of times they'll actually take you all the way over there. And then when the guest says, thank you, it's my pleasure. Now, some of you may have been around organizations, maybe even in that particular property, where they say, oh, it's my pleasure. Now, guess what? If their self-talk is, you know, you're the fifth idiot today that's asked me where the restrooms are. It's my pleasure. Okay, so we can say the words, but if our self-talk is not jiving with what it is that we're saying, if it's not in sync with what it is that we're actually saying, then guess what? The Native American Indian has this thing called speaking with forked tongue. And that's when you people, and you know this, you pick it up, you can feel whether a person is sincere or not. And they're going to be able to tell if you're sincere or not. And the way to do this is to know how and learn how to manage and control your self-talk. Mission control. Whatever it is that we're thinking about is going to come screaming out through our body language. If we're in it for the buck, if we're in it for the dollar, if we're in it for the quick hurry up and get me rich type of thing, guess what? People are going to pick up on it. They're going to feel it. And we can say, oh yes, I really care about my downline. I really care about all you people. And if all of a sudden my self-talk is, hurry up with your question, what, you know, I need to get on with this thing. If you aren't going to do anything right now, I need some talk to somebody over here that's going to make some money for me. Then guess what they're going to pick up on? So yes, it's important. So I can say I care, but until you know that I sincerely care about you, that's what will create the loyal downline. That's what will create the loyal customers. That's what will create the loyal family members. And if we start to understand how this affects every aspect of our life, one of the quick and easy ways that you can learn how to uh, manage, control your self-talk, number one, know that it's happening. Know that we're always going to talk to ourselves. We can't stop talking to ourselves. But what you can start to do is to listen to it and then start to ask yourself, are these the thoughts that are going to help me to accomplish my goals? Is this the type of person that I want to be? I work with lawyers in big cases. And what we do, we work with witness schools, witnesses, and we ask them, how do they want to be seen at the deposition? How do they want to be seen at the trial? Not what if they don't, well, I don't want to be angry and I don't want to come across uh, too, too pushy. And okay, that's fine. We identify everything that we don't want. Now then turn it around. What is it that we do want? But I want to do whatever I can to help you all to build your business, to build your organization, and to build your lives. As Yogi Berra said, I met him once, and he's one of my favorites. I said, Yogi, you know, I quote you a lot in my seminars and my talks. He looked at me, and I said, well, I saw where you were interviewed once, and they asked Yogi, the reporter said, how much of the game of baseball is mental? He thought for a moment, and he looked at the reporter, and he said, well, 90% of the game is half mental. Now, only Yogi can say it <laughs> like that. But a whole lot of this business, a whole lot of your life is mental. And what is that mental? It's that self-talk. So please, quit beating yourself up. Listen to what you're saying. Keep it focused. Let that trigger your reticular activating system. And then all of a sudden, you'll start to go, wow, how lucky am I? It's not luck. You're just bringing up to a conscious level what you've been doing. And all of a sudden, you can start to hit those consistent home runs. Thank you very much for your time and appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been listening to The Key to Successful Network Marketing with Dr. Jim Will. Now's the time to take action. Now's the time to use these tools and techniques in your network marketing business. Thanks for listening. This program was produced and edited at the studios of Eric Chase Creative Services, Houston, Texas. Copyright Jim Will, Ph.D. and Associates, Inc., 2005.